be here. This is really exciting for me. This is one of the first events that we've had at our eighth floor event space. We just launched this about two weeks ago, so we're really excited. Super pumped to have Bob now here today as well. Uh, Benjamin's desk is a co-working space for middle professionals, entrepreneurs, and startups. We're trying to create the epicenter of innovation here in Philadelphia. If you're an innovative company, we want you here at Benjamin's desk. Part of building an innovation epicenter involves having quality programming. So I was fortunate enough to, to help bring Startup Grind here to Philadelphia. Uh, thanks to guys like Carl who, who showed interest in uh, the, the quality of the programming that Startup Grind really is. And that's getting a chance to interview guys like Bob and other entrepreneurs, investors, guys that are founders and can, can really share and shed some light onto experiences and, and hopefully that'll, that'll send you in the right direction. Um, the, the Startup Grind community is a global community. It's based out of Silicon Valley. That's where the headquarters is, a global meetup. We're in over 50 cities and 10 countries uh, nationwide. And the mission is to educate, inspire, and connect. So the education, the inspiration from the speakers, and the idea that you guys should connect in here. So you and the audience, my goal for you today is to meet someone that you haven't met. Leave with a business card of someone that you do not know. That's all part of what we call this law of proximity and the serendipitous collisions that happen in co-working spaces. We really believe that where we're located here at 17th and Walnut, in the community we're building with which Benjamin's Destiny and Startup Prime, that we can engineer this idea of serendipity. And there's, there's people that are here that might not know each other, but you're here for a reason. And it could be a future business partner, a future, a future co-founder, or a future strategic partner. So really, really excited to have Bob now. Before I have bring Bob now, Bob is uh, a well-educated guy. He, he down at the University of Maryland. He's done executive programs uh, at MIT, as well as Michigan. He's been an entrepreneur and entrepreneur for uh, over 30 years in the high-tech industry. He's also a leader. He's the president of Philadelphia Startup Leaders. He sits on boards like PIDC, PAC, Ben Franklin Technology Partners. Uh, and he's, he's had a successful exit. As a president and CEO of Boomi, he sold to Dell in late 2010. And most recently, he's the president and CEO of Artist Noble, which has raised uh, just recently from First Mark Capital five and a half million dollars in Series A financing, and a total of seven million to date. So Bob is uh, Bob's one of the guys, he's a, he's a leader in this community, he's leading the, the charge of really defragmentizing what I think are some of the challenges we have in the Philadelphia startup ecosystem. And he's been a, a big uh, proponent of, of doing just that over the last year. Uh, without further ado, allow me to introduce Bob now. Mics for this space, but it, it'll help with the video. Testing, one, two, testing. Cool. Like it? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> so I introduced, you know, Bob and, and, and told you all the accolades that he has, but you know, part of what I really do here is dive in and, and learn a little bit from some of the challenges that Bob had, some of the opportunities that he's come across. Uh, pretty well versed guy, and, and like I said, is the leader of Philadelphia startup leaders. Thanks for all you're doing. Thanks for being here. Um, as my brother just creates awesome ambiance in our new space here. Um, thanks for what you're doing. I just want to say your brother is way more handsome than you are. <laughs> <laughs> Who's older? Uh, you are. Yeah. You get that a lot more younger. Really? Yeah. Well, he's better looking. That's my first thing, Bob. Hopefully, my wife doesn't care. <laughs> Thanks again for all you do. Thanks for being an ambassador for Philly. Um, I'd like to start in the beginning. I'd like to go back to EDS, working in the mailroom. You know, you know looking back uh, at your time there as, as a young high schooler, did, did you ever think 20 years later you, you had sold a company and be raising capital and being a leader in, in the ecosystem? Of, of course I did. Right? Yeah. Uh, the first thing I want to say, for, I want to say several things. First of all, Michael, thanks for having me out tonight. Secondly, I think we should thank our sponsors, the uh, pretzel chip guys over here, who uh, made this all possible this evening. Uh, and uh, I, you know, the whole 30-year thing. I just want to. I just want to. I started when I was 12. All right. So I was, I was 12, 42 now. So just so we have that out of the way. Uh, uh, I had no idea. I mean, I I was working in high school at a. At a Garage, you know, Ford dealership, uh, you know, combination Ford selling cars, gas station, um, and I was pumping gas, and I was changing 
tires and I was changing oil. I had no idea. But in 11th grade in high school, I took uh, a programming class in basic. Has anybody programmed in basic? I know you have. Come on. <laughs> right, basic. Beginners, all purpose, symbolic instruction code, right? And I fell in love. I just, I fell in love with uh, writing code. And the fact that you could tell the computer to do something, it would do what you told it to do, and whatever. And um, at that, from that moment on, I knew I wanted to work in IT. Second thing that happened was uh, at this garage that I worked at, I was pumping gas. Uh, one of the one of the guys that would come in every week was uh, was related to the owner, but he worked at EDS. And if you don't know EDS, I don't know how many people know who, who EDS is. Ross Perot, right? Okay. So. Uh, he would come in every week and I would pump his gas and you know check his his tires and clean his windows and whatever. But he would tell me about this great company, EDS. It was the number one IT company in the world. And so by the time I graduated high school, I knew that I wanted to go work for EDS. I wanted to go work for Ross Perot. And uh, all this guy ever did for me was he gave me the name of the recruiter, one of the EDS recruiters. And at 17, I went and I had this meeting with this recruiter, and I said, I want to, I want, I want to come work for EDS. And uh, they put me through such misery; it was so funny. Uh, the first thing was that they, you know they said, well, you're not ready to make this commitment, and you should go. You know, how many other places have you applied to? I said, I didn't apply to any place else. I want to come work for EDS. And so they they forced me to go out and try to find a job somewhere else. So I did. I went and I interviewed with all these different companies, uh, and of course everyone turned me down. Uh, I didn't have a college education. I was a you know, brand new you know, graduate from high school, and uh, and I came back. And, I, and, and the cool thing was that this was before the era of the uh, of the PC, right? So I hand wrote everything. I had like tablet paper. I wrote a, I spoke to IBM today and. <laughs> They had no openings for people with no education and whatever. And I spoke to, you know, I wrote this whole report up and I, I took it back to them. They were, so they were very impressed with that. I went through like three or four interviews. And the last interview, they're showing me the data center. I'm like, oh, I've been now. They're showing, they're showing me the data center and the tape drives and the disk drives. And, I was, and he took me back to the room and he said, we're really impressed with you, but we're not going to offer you a job. You know, you're just too young. Uh, you're not ready to make this commitment, whatever. And, say, and, uh, and so I asked him, the last thing I asked him before I left was, would you mind if every once in a while I just gave you a call to check in? He's like, Bob, absolutely. Call me anytime. So I went back to work at the gas station. I called him every Friday <laughs> for three months. I said, like, hey, Jim, it's Bob. I'm just checking in, buddy. How's it going there? And I'll never forget, I was working there, I had pretty much given up hope at this point. My dad wanted me to go to work for a vacuum cleaner uh, company. Uh, and I got the call one day, and Jim Lewis called me, the recruiter, and he's like, Bob, I have a job for you. I just went very clear, it has nothing to do with EDS, nothing to do with EDS. We need somebody to deliver the mail. I was like, I'm there, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. And that's how, that's how I got into EDS. I was 17, and I started in the mail. Into, okay. I don't know how you follow up with that. Well, I guess a, a broader topic, which is kind of a hot trend with what's going on in education. Um, That's an awesome segue. Go ahead. Higher high ed. Do you have any advice? I mean, I was just talking to Mike Rager, you know, obviously, and I get a chance to. Where's Mike at? So Mike's son is, you know, is, is starting freshman year, and he's participating in two startup weekends, and they're working on Boxley and all this stuff, which you know. But it's so fascinating being a startup weekend and seeing what's going on with higher ed. Do you, do you have any thoughts or ideas around, you know, high schoolers just taking the plunge and going out being entrepreneur? This is a tough one. I mean, I'm the wrong guy to ask, first of all, right? Because I, I don't, I don't have an undergraduate degree. I, I didn't go to college. I didn't want to go to college. Um, I went back 10 or 15 years ago, got a master's degree from the University of Maryland. Thank you very much. Um, let's say I think, I think higher ed is broken. Uh, it's an antiquated system. It's outdated. It's outmoded. Uh, it needs to be. It needs to be fixed. Uh, and so it's hard for me to say to a kid like Zach, "Hey, you absolutely should go to college." Um, I think the value is to the 
to the degree that that um, companies and uh, people who are hiring people put a, put a premium on degrees, and where you know, that, then it has some value. But um, it, you know, it's 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 definitely broken. And um, you know, at the same time, I feel like businesses should should get off the sidelines, get involved with the the universities, be uh, very. Get engaged in terms of what we're looking for, in terms of people we're trying to hire, and help to to uh, evolve the curriculum. Um, you know, I would never tell a kid don't go to college, right? Because that's that's I don't think that's the right the right message. Uh, and I would also also tell them that the path I took is a very difficult path. Um, but there's certainly room for for improvement in terms of how we're educating kids today. I mean, the USA has fallen from first to I think it's 29th and 30th. In terms of competitiveness in the world, that's a problem. We've got to fix it. So, what brought you to Philadelphia? And when, when you were going through it, yes, where, where were you from? What brought you to Philly? I grew up in a small town south of Harrisburg called East Berlin. How many people have heard of East Berlin? If you raise your hand, I'm going to totally call you out on it. <laughs> You've heard of East Berlin? My grandparents lived in Chippenford for a long time. I feel sorry for you. My wife was from Lancaster. Lancaster. Right, so if you go to Lancaster and turn left and keep going west, <laughs> you will eventually run into East Berlin, a uh, town of about 2,000 people. Uh, we had one red light, uh, two gas stations, two grocery stores, and, uh, and, that, and that's where I grew up. I'm one generation removed from the farm. My mom grew up on a working farm. My dad, my dad was worked in a factory. Um, so that, that's where I came from. I ended up at EDS because uh, they were in Camp Hill, so just on the other side of the river from Harrisburg. That's where you know I got my start. Um, and then, funnily enough, uh, one of the accounts that I had many years down the road was uh, with the city of Philadelphia, actually with the uh, the Navy, the Navy and the Navy Yard, right? And so EDS won a big, big contract to modernize all of the information systems. Navy Yard, so this was back You in, clearly had an affinity for the Navy, Ross Perot. Absolutely. Navy I like By the way, the story about Ross Perot and how he got into the Navy, we could spend, we could spend hours just on that because he didn't meet any other criteria. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we, I was here, whatever that was, in the mid 80s. We were modernizing the information systems for the Navy. How many of you remember the boob fire that happened back? Back in the mid '80s, I was, I was here. I was in a hotel room, and I was like looking at the flames and the smoke uh, happening, and that was incredible. So that was my first time. I came back uh, in 2000 to run a company called SCT, uh, which if almost all the major universities in the United States run a product called Banner, uh, which is a student administration system that was done by SCT. I ran that in the early 2000s. Uh, I went, I went, I moved away for a little while. So I always tell people, like, Philadelphia has drawn me back over and over and over again. Uh, I'm here to stay. This is, I've lived all over the world. I've lived in all over the U.S. I've lived in England. I've lived in Hong Kong. I've lived in Australia. And Philadelphia is, in my view, uh, the most fantastic city on the So I'm here to stay. I agree. So you mentioned SCT. Let's talk SCT for a minute. You, you were leading, I believe, was the higher end division, $300 million business unit. Uh, through the, the exit to SunGuard for about $650 million. What'd you learn? You had to learn a, a ton of stuff working for a company like that. That was a unique time for higher ed, and they were trying to figure out how to offer the systems and the students and communication platforms, Blackboard was coming online. Talk me a bit and what you learned. Well, first of all, it was an amazing experience for me personally. I, I started with SCT to run their outsourcing the business, having just left EDS after 20 years of EDS. And uh, I, you know, I was asked to come in, turn that around, and, and get it profitable, which I did in about six months. And literally one day, uh, I was working uh, seriously in like a broom closet. Right? Like no, it was it was the size of a broom closet. There were no windows. Uh, I'll never forget. One day they came and said, Bob, we'd really like to brighten off your office. Uh, can we put a painting in your office? And I was like, Yeah, sure. And they brought that. Do you remember that painting? Of Cowboys running through the, the thunderstorm with the clouds behind them and the lightning and the rain. I was like, really? Like that's going to brighten up my office? <laughs> uh, but that's that's what they brought me. And, and so uh, anyway, I was in a broom closet and I got called to the chairman's office one morning. And I was like, I'm going to get fired. And I, I, I went down the hallway and Mike Emmy, if you don't know Mike Emmy, great guy in Philadelphia, uh, called me to his office and he's like. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to fire the president.
president of the education division, the senior vice president of sales, and the senior vice president of services. And I want you to take over the business. And tell me how you would do that. And I was like, whoa, okay. So, you know, we had a, we had a about an hour long conversation. And, and he said, by the way, you know, at the beginning he said, you're my top candidate. And so at, the next day, he did it. The next morning, he fired the president, he fired the SVP of services, fired the SVP of sales, and suddenly I'm in charge of a $200 million you know, division of, of uh, SCT. And uh, you know, he took me into a room with what was left of the, the executive team, which wasn't much, and said, team, here's Bob, Bob, here's team, I expect great things, and he, and he, walked, and he walked out. So um, I guess I learned a lot of things with that job. Uh, you know, the the first thing was we were we were very 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 bloated in terms of the size of the team, and one of the hardest things I had to do was I, I fired uh, 80 or 90 people right out of the gate. Um, but I, I I called a town hall meeting. I had 1,100 employees, um, and I told them what I was going to do. I, I said, listen, we're not competitive. We're not investing in our product. We're bloated. I'm going to have to let some of you go. It's going to be painful. I'm going to do a quick limit and humanely. And with the savings, we're going to invest in our product, and we're going to get competitive again, and we're going to do great things. And I did that. We went away. We, we put this together. We let 80, 90 people go from the company. Uh, we took the savings. We brought it back into the product. Uh, we put 10 record quarters together back to back. We ended up selling the SunGuard for 600 and I still have people to this day who come up to me and say, I was one of the people that you fired at SET, and I would come work for you. And you know, that, to me, it's like, it's just treating people with respect. It's like treating people the way you would want to be treated. It's not their fault that we, they got, we got to where we were. And, um, and, and, and you know, I think I was just very transparent about that. We are where we are. We've got to fix it. We're not going to be competitive if we don't do this. Um, and, and I think, like I said, the, the greatest uh, you know, feedback to me is that they, they, they would come to it again. And sure. So that's, I think that's a key learning. Uh, there, are, there are things that are validated. I mean, bad news doesn't get better with age. Uh, we had promised a new product to the market that we were never going to be able to deliver. I stood up in front of 5,000 people at our user conference and said, we're not going to deliver this product. Here's why. It doesn't make sense. You're going to be very disappointed in us. Uh, we're going to reinvest in the product we already have. That's a very that's a very hard thing to do. And uh, but whether they agree with you or disagree with you, I think at the end of the day they respect if you're straight up with them and you tell them like it is, and then you do what you say what you're going to do. say what you're going to do, do what you're going to say, and people respect you for that. And at that time, new product development talking one, two, three, several years. Yeah. Well, particularly at, at tax base. Yeah. So let's, let's fast forward. Let's talk. Let's talk booming. Uh, you and your future sold at the Dell in 2010. Um, take us back, I guess, when you joined the team. With, how'd you know Rick? Uh, joined the team. Where, what stage were they at? What, what type of health of, of the company? And what did the future look like? Um, I, so I didn't actually know Rick. I knew I knew Mike West, who was the original angel investor in the company. He was a client of mine at NES uh, years ago. Quick funny story. ICI, Imperial Chemicals Industries out of the UK, probably never heard of them. How many people have heard of ICI? If you raise your hand again, I'm going to call you. <laughs> uh, they outsourced EDS, and I was, I was the account manager. And the funny part was Mike West uh, was the CIO, and after we outsourced, he really I mean, for the most part, didn't have a job anymore, right? So he resigns and he leaves, and he goes and starts an SAP consulting practice. And he sells it in 1999, at the height of the you know, dot-com era, uh, for a lot of money. And so, uh, and the funny thing, Rick Nucci, who was the founder of Boomi, his wife was working for Mike at this company, and she comes home one night and says, well, Mike just sold the company to ICI, and Rick being the student entrepreneur that he was, went and met with Mike, and he said, well, I've got this new startup. You apparently have a little pocket change. Uh, and Mike was the first investor into, into Boom. Uh, so I knew Mike from years and years and years prior to that at, at EDS. So he called me, and he started calling me, honestly, like two years before I went 
to work for, for Boomi. And he's like, you got to come. you got to check this company out. They're doing great things, whatever. He's like, Mike, I'm busy. You know, I just started a job, you know, whatever. The universe works in really mysterious ways sometimes. But like, every, every other opportunity I had sort of went by the wayside. And like, Boomi was there. Like, you, you got to go do this Boomi thing. So I agreed in December 2005 to join the board. And uh, I did that. And then in early 2006, I agreed to sort of do a consulting engagement with, with them to help them sort of look at the business. Where are we? Where do we want to go? Uh, redo the strategy. Redo the book. Everything. We, re we redid everything about the movie. And, um, and that's how we got going. I mean, I uh, uh, worked with Rick Nucci, who was the founder <coughs> and CTO. At that point, they were five years in. They were modestly successful, but they were never going to be sort of that home run ball that I think all the investors had hoped for, and you know, that's why I was brought in to try it. I'm always fascinated with technology and how in such a short period of time we can see just dramatic changes in technology. You see it in the future of mobile. Uh, before we talk to Artisan, they'll describe the product that we uh, as disruptive. So talk about the mobile product then, and then three years, we're coming up on three years, I think, since Yes. So what does technology look like in the cloud space now? Well, I think, that, first of all, I think cloud is disrupting just about everything. Uh, just like the internet did, you know, with, with uh, so many different businesses, including higher education, by the way. Uh, what the internet did was remove every person in a transaction that didn't add value to the transaction. So if you were a middleman and you weren't really adding value, the internet is just obliterating those people. Education, by the way, is all about the person who has the knowledge and the person who wants the knowledge. Everything in between there is, is noise. Uh, and so I think we'll continue to see fallout from, from that. <coughs> Boomi had had a great business model. Um, they, were, they were solving uh, a very non-sexy problem. Uh, you know, uh, Mike, Mike Arrington, you guys know Mike Arrington. He, we refer to integration as mufflers. Uh, it doesn't get any less sexy than, than mufflers. Um, but it was a it was a it was a fundamental problem, you know, and it's still, frankly, to this day, integration of applications is a, is a fundamental problem. So, what we did was take it to the take it to the cloud. I mean, uh, if you could do it with on-premise software, you know, the, the idea was if you could do it in the cloud, it would be so much cheaper and faster and easier. So we were the first. Boomi was the first integration middleware platform in, in the cloud, and. Uh, like Salesforce integration, CRM system. Exactly. I mean, the biggest problem that all the SaaS players, had, including Salesforce, had, by the way, Salesforce was the first the first company to approach me about an acquisition. Um, they they all had a great value prop, which was we have this awesome app that runs in the cloud. All you have to do is get a, an account, log on, and use it. Right. The problem was everybody said, "Great, I'm going to run your CRM. How does it integrate with my HR system?" still on premise. My finance system that is still on premise. My whatever system is still on premise. And they didn't have an answer for that. And so we came along and we had we solved that problem. And in the early days it was so fun. We could literally close partners in one phone call. We would we would show them the deck, we would show them the demo, and at the end of the demo they'd go like where where like where do we sign up? Uh, including Salesforce and uh, uh, right now. Or the building company. Uh, all, all the big SaaS players out on the valley. Uh, so that that that's really was the key to our success. Every, every entrepreneur obviously goes to uh, is, you know if your your goal is to be a founder, bring bring a company to market, eventually exit, go public, you know all the dreams. It's really really hard to do. You know that. But let's dive a little bit deeper into like the first phone call from Dell. They think they want a partner, and then you know what does that look like? The, I think that happens a lot. We've seen that in a lot of access with we were especially with acquire hires and things like that where you work closer together, you think you're gonna be partners, and next thing you know, you're you're in position. Well the, the first part was actually Salesforce. Um, so I mean I'll share with you guys tonight, uh, I don't know how, how public it's ever been, but we were way down the path with a partnership with Salesforce. And you know how they have their services cloud and they have their sales cloud. We were going to be their integration club. We were going to do a white label uh, deal with Salesforce where Boomi was going to be the, the integration club. And uh, way down the path, 
we have spent 18 months probably on that meal together. Um, and I'll never forget, we got called to, uh, a lot of people obviously know Mark, Mark Benioff, right, as, as the founder of uh, Salesforce. Uh, Parker Harris is actually a co-founder and is a technology guy at Salesforce. So we got, we got sort of summons to his office. Uh, Rick Nucci and I is, is the founder of my business partner. And I'll never forget, we went out, we flew all the way out to the West Coast. Like, this is it, we're gonna do this big OEM deal, right? Finally, after 18 months. And uh, we came into the office and, and there's all these weird people sitting here. Like it's people from, you know, uh, Corp Dev and, and other parts of the company. Like, well, this is kind of odd. But Parker uh, runs the meeting and he's going on and on and on about how great our technology is, how great our solution is. And we're like, yeah, yeah, this is probably gonna happen. And he says, but I can't do this deal. And we were just like crestfallen. And you know, we were kind of like waiting and he said, yeah, you know, if, if we do this OEM deal, you know, I'm gonna have to put my name on it as Salesforce and you're not really part of my organization and I'm gonna, you know, it's just not gonna work. And so we're gonna have to say, so, so uh, we'd actually like to buy it. And uh, we want you to be part of the Salesforce family. <laughs> so, so, so now we're like, we went from here to here <laughs> in the space of like five minutes. And I'm still sitting there shell shocked. And I'll never forget Parker looks at me and goes, What do you have to say? I said, Well, I'm flattered. Uh, but I really don't want to screw up this OEM deal that we've been working on. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, we went back and forth. He was like, Well, we're going to buy your company. He literally said to me, I was like, well, Look, I'm flattered, but we're really not looking to sell. He said to me, We are going to buy your company. And if I need to call your investors or whoever I need to call them, so we went down a path with them, and I told them right up front, I said, look, here's what's going to happen. You are going to you know, do your due diligence, and you're going to put an offer together, and we're going to be very disappointed in the offer, and then you and I are going to be upset with each other, and then my only end deal is out the window. And I don't want that to happen, and that's exactly what happened. So they went, they went through the due diligence, they put an offer together, it was, it was not compelling whatsoever. Uh, in the meantime, we probably had, we probably had six to ten other companies who were interested in Marvels, uh, which is a great place to be. And uh, Dell, we had been we had been pursuing a partnership with Dell, a uh, reseller arrangement. Uh, and so one of the, you know uh, when we when we realized that the Salesforce deal wasn't coming together, this is the most stressful situation I've ever been in, under in my entire life. My board and my investors decide let's run a process. You have all these people who are interested. Let's get an investment banker involved. Let's run a process. Let's see what the business is actually worth. And I'm like, do we tell Salesforce that we're doing this? And they're like, no. So, you know, I'm, for the next like two months, I'm doing this dual thing. Like, I'm having one conversation with Salesforce and I'm having this completely different conversation with, with everybody else, which is very, very, very stressful. Um, we probably had, like, again, six to 10 different companies. We, we contacted Dell. Um, and the funny part of the story was, so, you know, we get down the path with a number of people. Dell was very, very interested. And uh, I don't know if you know this, I didn't know this, but Michael Dell and Mark Benioff both own, like, these giant compounds in Hawaii, on the big island of Hawaii, right? Like, apparently across the street from each other, whatever that means, in Hawaii. <laughs> but, uh, and one day, they run into each other. And Michael says to, now imagine this, like, Benioff, miles down the road, says, Michael says to, to Benioff, I'm about to buy this really cool company. <laughs> and Benioff's like, really? Who is that? He goes, this is, oh, you never heard of him. It's this company called Boomi. I mean, imagine the look on Benioff's face. I cannot tell you how fast that went from Benioff to the Corp Dev guys to my phone in uh, Berwyn, Pennsylvania. And I literally had to hold the phone out here when, when the call came. Uh, they were not happy. Uh, I wouldn't do anything wrong, but they, but they certainly weren't, weren't happy with, uh, with whatever. So, uh, long story short, I mean, I think everybody had a very fair shake at buying the company. Uh, Dell ended up the winner. Uh, I'll never forget, uh, Rick and I took a phone call one evening from Michael Dell. Uh, he was calling from a, a taxi cab in, literally in Shanghai, China. And uh, he calls me, he's like, I want to buy your company. And it was, it was, it was wow. And of course, the call kept dropping because <laughs> he was in Shanghai in a taxi. How much? Say that again. 
And, uh, but anyway, it was, it was a very cool moment when, uh, when we got to talk about it. So switching topics a bit, we talked about investors and, and their feedback in this entire process. It's, it's a big topic uh, here in Philadelphia, we talked about bootstrapping. It's, it's a big topic all around the world, obviously. It's when to bootstrap, when to raise capital, uh, any advice from the entrepreneurs in the room that are kind of in that stage, whether they're in private alpha or they have customers or they just have a pitch deck of 15 slides. What are your thoughts on, on, on having all time? And you're going to be positioned because you've become the you both bootstrap as well as raise capital. So. And this is an important conversation, and, and, and I, you know, I think we need to get our heads on straight about this in, in Philadelphia. Um, this is not a religious argument between whether you raise money or don't raise money. Um, in my view, it comes down to uh, every business has a theoretical optimum amount of capital to achieve the, the potential of business, but it also, what's the, what's the objectives of the, of the entrepreneurs and the founders? We have to take that into consideration. And so I really wish we could sort of move away from this, you know, bootstrapping versus raising capital. I, I think both paths are equally uh, valid. Uh, it depends on what your goals are. And I think, I think you, can, you can go either way. You can start a business of capital, and you can drown a business of capital. You can raise, raise too much money. Um, so it really depends, and uh, uh, you know I think it's important to get your you know to get our heads on straight about is this a high potential business? Is this a lifestyle business? I, I, I'm not pointing you know all of those are fantastic. First of all, for all of you in the audience tonight, how many of you here are entrepreneurs trying to get a business going? Fantastic. God bless you. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. The, the, like the best thing we can do for the city is create businesses, create jobs, create opportunities. Um, it, you know, it depends on what your objectives are. I, I have a business that there's no way I could get from where I am to cash flow positive without capital. Uh, it's a SaaS-based business. We take a small slice each time, you know, of, of, the, of the platform that we're building. Sure, in the old days, I would have sold it as an enterprise license. I got one customer who's willing to pay me $2 million for, you know, the annual but We're there, right? I mean, that, that, it doesn't work that way anymore. The upside of it is the cost don't work. Right, right. So now you have to talk computing. You can ramp up a business on Amazon very inexpensively. Um, so my advice to entrepreneurs is is more to think through what is it you're trying to accomplish. Where are you at in business? I can't tell you how many meetings I take with entrepreneurs and they come to me and say, oh, they're just they're fretting and they're fretting and they're fretting. I just don't know. Should I raise money or should I not raise money? And with, with all due respect, like to rate you. To raise money, you're one percent of the one percent. Like I wouldn't worry so much about, oh my God, are the people gonna, like should I raise this money or not? Like, do you even have the potential to raise money, right? <laughs> right? You, I, I mean, it, it's a long shot that you're going to be able to convince somebody that you have a business model and a business that warrants people to put money into. So I wouldn't worry so much about that. I'd be worried more about how how am I growing my business? Do I have a solid business? Have I vetted the market? Have I vetted the customers? Do I have something that is real and can scale? And then, and then the, the money side will sort itself out. So this is an interesting segue. I, I, I can completely agree with your answer. Uh, yeah, of course you do. Some of the dialogue you see on the, on the PSL thread about bootstrapping and, and fundraising, it's interesting. Uh, Bob, obviously, is the, is the president of PSL, so it's the PSL list. Who's on the PSL digest here? About 25%. So hopefully we come out with a new product to kind of save all our email boxes from trying to go down the PSL digest every day. But yeah, I've seen the topic raised a bunch of times and I thought it was noteworthy to bring it up here in Philadelphia. I appreciate it. Good about it. So before we jump into Artisan, let's talk about founder and partner dynamics. Uh, my example, I mentioned this desk, right? So my wife's my co-founder. We, we started here. We did that financing. We were fortunate to get some, some money from a bank, SBA loan. And hasn't been announced yet, but more recently we raised the small seed round from a venture capital firm, 76 Capital. They now cohabitate with us. Um, and we think the space industry is really interesting. It's, 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 it's in its infancy. But what I found interesting with, with your path, and I only bring it up as, as the, to compare apples to apples, is with Rick and with Scott Bosper now, you, you found founder CTOs that you obviously like, um, which is really, really important, right? Uh, as well as 
finding an idea, a market, an opportunity, that you think is has some potential. Can you talk a little bit about the, the, the founder, partner, president, CEO dynamics that you have there? Yeah, I, they, well, first of all, they're crucial. I mean, and regardless of what the titles are, co founders, you, you got to be able to work really, really closely together. Um, so, the, you know, the dynamics, the chemistry, all, all of that is very, very important. Um, what I feel like I've been able to do with both Rick and Scott and SCT and a bunch of things prior to that um, is uh, take these incredibly, uh, you know, cool things that they have in their heads and, and present it in a very digestible sort of way. Uh, I didn't invent Gomi. I mean, it's funny, when I, when I, I approached Rick when we were doing the whole business plan, I said, you know, this whole SaaS thing, back then we didn't call it cloud, it was SaaS, software as a service. I said, should we be looking at SaaS? And he says to me, oh my God, I can't believe that you, you said that. I, I have this whole presentation. And he did, he had this whole deck already built about how we should take integration into the cloud and build a software as a service model for, for integration. And uh, it was hard. <laughs> it was a great idea, but his deck, like no one would have ever bought it. I mean, you know, the thing that became the Boomi Atom, uh, he called it integration process container. Right? Developers love that shit, like IPC. <laughs> They're like, that, that will never sell. We gotta call it something else. But I, you know, I, I think the synergy has always been like taking the incredibly complex ideas that they have that are incredibly valuable and boiling them down to what does that mean to the market? What does that mean to me as a business? What's the business value that I can do from that? And that's been, that's been the, the synergy that I built with Rick at and now it's kind of Awesome. First off, i got to tell you, Artisan's logo. I love it. It's Thank clean. You. It's classy. I love the shout out to 29. Oh uh, yeah? 29 did that in uh, Manio. Uh, those guys are awesome. Very cool. Uh, awesome logo. Talk a little about App Renaissance, the evolution, uh, Mike Graver's here, UX Flip. Walk us through that process and for, for the folks that may not know, going into as much detail as you feel comfortable. Is that feel comfortable? That's uh, so intriguing. Uh, Michael's been in the back corner there. Raise your hand, Michael. So, um, all right, so when I was sitting at Dell for a year and wanting to put a fork in my eye, uh, <laughs> I was thinking about what's what's the next big thing, and uh, mobile. And I was like, mobile is cloud on steroids, right? I mean, so I knew it was mobile. Um, and my theory was that people who were building mobile apps would see where the white space opportunities are for products. Um, and let's face it, like the one thing I have learned in 30 plus years of being in, in the industry, every wave of technology, all of the all of the infrastructure, all of the tools have to be rebuilt. What worked for mainframe didn't work for main or mid range, didn't work for client server, didn't work for web, isn't going to work for mobile. And so that, that was my, I, all I had was a working theory. Uh, and I went, I met with a lot of people, I was like, I really want to be uh, a really cool app development company because my theory is they will know where, where the gaps are in, in, uh, you know, in the product set. And that's how I got introduced to Scott. In the meantime, I was a, uh, an advisor at uh, Dream Adventures. Everybody probably familiar with Dream around town. Michael was one of the companies in Dream Adventures. He had a company called Feedback Trail. Uh, I was assigned to Michael as his mentor, and uh, you know we we started down the path of Feedback Trail. And I thought it was interesting. I certainly thought it was interesting. Uh, and my first time being a mentor at you know Dream, I was like, how, how tough are we supposed to be on these people? Whatever. And I was like, Michael, this is cool, but I don't think it's really ever going to be a big business. I think it's going to be a cool feature some, someday, but it's not going to be a big business. And, and uh, he goes away, and I don't hear from him for several weeks. And, uh, and then I get this call. He's like, Bob, I got something I want to show you. I was like, okay, cool. So I go back. He pulls me into a room, and he draws on the board essentially what is now today, you know, artisan. And uh, it was all about A-B testing mobile apps. And I, and, and, right? Am I right? I said to you, on the spot, now this, that's hot. That's shit hot. And you need to go figure out how to get that funded and build a business out of it. And so uh, he did. I mean, he, he built it. And uh, he, he was going around town presenting the prototype to many, many people. Um, 
And so one day I arranged for a serendipitous meeting of my investor and Michael in our offices. I was like, Michael, show me that cool thing you do with your, uh, you know, where you do the little thing over here and the app changes, you know, mobile app changes in real time. I'll never get my, my investor's eyes were like this big, you know, when he saw that happen. So, uh, long story short, we ended up doing an acting honor of Michael and his technology and uh, his IP, and that became the core of what is now uh, artists. Kudos, kudos to Michael. Uh, Michael's now the product, well, you are our overall sort of innovation lead in the company, and he's also the product lead uh, on a new product we'll be delivering here in the next month uh, called Artists and Personalized. For the first time ever, uh, and you're hearing this for the first time tonight, people will be able to personalize the experience they have on a native mobile app, uh, which is really, really cool. So today when you download a native app, it's on your phone and it doesn't change again until, until you update. Uh, and that could be, who knows, I have 30 updates waiting on me at any given time on, on my phone. And our technology, Marcus technology, allows you to, to update the app in real time. And just like today, we go to a website, you know, how many, 40 of us here tonight all go to the same website, we can get completely different experiences. We're delivering that for, uh, for mobile apps. Um, so based on your age, gender, uh, buying habits, geography, whatever, we can serve up a completely different uh, experience to, uh, to the end user. No one else in the industry is doing that. It's being done right here in Philadelphia. And uh, we're very proud of you. That's awesome. Loving that. Uh, I think I went to the website today and I was checking out the, just a, a quick integration they showed a map and it showed, I think it was like, 204 Market Street, right where your headquarters is now. 234. 234, so yeah, I'm close. But that's really cool. Yeah. This type of stuff, this is industry leading, game changing type of stuff. Enterprise software system play happening here in Philadelphia. That's awesome. We should all be proud of that. Um, First Mark Capital, they've been investors in uh, you and your previous company. Now, just raised Series A financing, $5 million. They've invested in companies like Pinterest and Aereo, you guys may see. How's it working with them? And I want to segue into starting PHL, kind of what they've been well, first of all, the guys at First Part are phenomenal. Um, so back when we were trying to get the lead financed, uh, they believed in us. And uh, uh, we closed our eight round of booming in July of 2008. If you guys remember the economic climate of 2008, uh, if we'd have been a month later, I wouldn't be sitting here having this pleasant conversation with you. Probably be a uh, so, they were big believers in what we were doing. Who me, uh, Amish Johnny, who was on the board, phenomenal guy. Uh, you know, it was a very easy conversation the second time around. I, we went up, I went up to New York. Uh, Amish and I were having tequilas, and uh, he's like, "What do you want to do this time?" And I didn't even have, we didn't even have the product. I didn't even, you know, we hadn't met Michael. I hadn't done anything at this point with any of this. I just said, "Look, I think there's a lot of opportunity in mobile space. I think there's some great product opportunities here." Uh, I don't have much more than that. And we went on with a meal, and I was like, oh shit, it's not going to do anything. At the end, he's like, well, how much do you need? And I was like, well, I can get started with this. I, you know, I personally put a significant amount of money in, and, and we got going. Uh, as, your, as your post exit, free, here's a million dollars for your idea. Yeah, exactly. You know. uh, so they've been phenomenal. I mean, Misha's been phenomenal. Um, uh, very supportive, uh, hands off. They believe in the vision, you know, go execute. So working, working with those guys has been, has been incredible. It, it was interesting as we was checking out Startup PHL, and you've been a big proponent in bringing Startup PHL here. It was done in New York City with First Mark. Talk a little about Startup PHL, what you may have learned about the, the First Mark deal with a uh, city contributor, EC managed type coding will fun, um, and what do you think the future looks like for Startup PHL here in the world? Well, Startup PHL uh, is huge. So, uh, one of the one of the I guess most fun moments I've had in the last couple of years after I took over as president of PSL, um, a bunch of people came to me and said, "Hey, the mayor really wants to meet you." And I was like, "Really? He wants to meet you?" <laughs> and, uh, and and this kind of went around and around. We finally arranged for a meeting, and I went, I went and met with mayor. And we sat down, and you know, uh, it was pretty funny actually. I got to tell you the story. I come in the office. He comes walking up to me. He goes. He's like, shake my hand. He goes, so, you're the man. I'm like, no, actually, you're the man. He goes, no, you're the man. I'm like, no, 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 you're the man. So we kind of went back and forth a little bit with that. Uh, we sat down, and he opened his book. He's been very well briefed and very serious. He's like, what do we need to do? Literally, the, the mayor of 
the city of Philadelphia said, what do we need to do to create a vibrant tech ecosystem, startup community here in Philadelphia? And I went through, you know, all the things that I had been hearing and learning over the last couple of years uh, that I spent, you know, diving into the startup community. I talked through the, what I call the hard factors and the soft factors. Hard factors being things like capital and space, and mentors and those types of things. Soft factors being things like we've got to change the way we think about this city. This city, by the way, suffers from, you know, uh, just this tremendous uh, self-confidence issue. And, and, and I, I get asked this all the time, like, what would it take for Phil? It's just, we're our own worst enemy, right? It's just to get out of our own way. Again, the stuff you guys are doing here uh, means so much. Just be successful. That's, that's it. Just be successful. Get out there and build business, grow businesses, great jobs, be successful, we'll be fine. So anyway, uh, he latched on to the startup gap. And he's like, well, Bob, you know, as mayor, if I call around to some of the high net worth individuals and you know, could I, you know, this I say I, yes, probably. But you know, there's a model already developed in, in New York City uh, where you know the city put up some money, uh, they put it out to RFP, they had the venture capital community bid on it, match it, uh, and in the city of New York, they put up three million bucks. First Mark Capital, whose investors in Gobi and in Artisan, put up 19 million dollars, they had 22 million dollars seed fund. It was the first of what then became a series of probably half a dozen seed funds uh, in, in New York City. Bloomberg is a genius, by the way. I, I spent a lot of time in New York. I went out a couple years ago. I met with his senior advisor for economic development entrepreneurship. Uh, I met with the EDC. I met with his, uh, uh, you know, the deputy director for uh, economic development. He's a genius. You know, they have put money into the incubators. They put money, money into the startup fund. They put money into a new uh, institution on, what is it, Roosevelt Island or something up there, where they're building a whole new tech, tech uh, institute. Uh, he, he, he's phenomenal. So we took all that learning, we came back, and in the fall of last year, we put together a startup PHL uh, for the city of Philadelphia. The city, through PIBC, put $3 million forward. Uh, it was put out to RFP, first round capital, or first round capital, uh, Josh Koppelman. Uh, we're the winning bidders on that. They matched it. We now have a six million dollar uh, seed fund in the city of Philadelphia. First time ever uh, to invest in startups in, in the city of Philadelphia with a five hundred thousand dollar idea fund. So uh, any idea that you have to improve the startup community, uh, the city is putting up money to uh, to support that. I, I think it's phenomenal. I, you know, kudos to the mayor. Kudos to the administration. I think it's great. Awesome. Now I'm going to put you on the spot. You had a magic wand. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, no, I have some tough questions. Here. If you had a magic wand, you could do anything right now to help the startup tech ecosystem in the city of Philadelphia. Taxes, more capital, more venture, more angel, what would it be? Well, I, I, I get a lot of grief for this, but I, but I think capital is, is uh, it takes money to build businesses. I mean, uh, think back to when our ancestors, you know, came over here from, from you know, uh, from Europe or wherever. Uh, it takes money to get a business going. It takes money to start a business. And there was a time when that was a prideful thing, like to build, to build a business and create a business and create a legacy for your family and create jobs. That was an awesome thing. Today, for some reason, I don't, I don't know why it's sort of frowned upon. Uh, that's what we're. That's what's going to get us back on track as as a, as a country. So uh, I think it's capital. But in the city of Philadelphia, frankly, I think it's 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 our own. Uh, Again, I go back to this sort of, uh, we have a self-image problem. And uh, if I could fix anything, if I could fix anything, if I could wave a wand and fix it for the city of Philadelphia, it would be that. It would be everybody, everybody feeling like we actually deserve to be here. We actually deserve to be on this playing field. We actually can create incredible businesses. We deserve to be funded. We deserve to grow. And get out of this, uh, this feeling of being second best to anybody in, I love it. Guys like Alex and, and his company just going out there and just doing it. I never thought they were second Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Love um, that. Love that. Let's do some uh, Q and A. If you would, uh, just raise your hand. I'll call on you. If you, if you mind, just standing up, saying what your name is. If you have an organization or a company, just standing up as well. So, questions for Bob. Wow, I want to go second. Who wants to go second? I want to go second. Who wants to go first? Who wants to go third? <laughs> Go first. That's all good. Oh, yeah. Dwarves, dwarves. Oh, I gotta take off some 
Hello. Uh, my name is Carl Epolito. Um, I own, own my own company. I work for SAP. I wish I owned SAP. Uh -huh. So before working at SAP, um, I was in San Francisco in the startup community. And we were one of the, I asked this at the first startup grind with, with uh, Wayne, but we were one of the companies that did make it. So we slept on couches, we raised money, we just bombed beautifully. So when, it may be you have to, when have you bombed or when have you failed? And so what did you do to make that next step to, to succeed? Um, so I know my, my next step was to go to business school, which Josh and I met Mike, and then go to SAP, which for me worked out perfectly, but, um, but it wasn't to get back in entrepreneurship. So how did you, if you failed, how did you progress? Talk about failure, right? <laughs> <laughs> Analogy to me. Uh, okay, so I would say the the one time that I feel like I really, I really, yeah, you know, I came up short was uh, when we tried to get movie funded for the first time. Uh, I was I was making that awkward transition from having spent 20, 25 years in the corporate world to being an entrepreneur and all that, and we went out to raise money and. And I was like, how hard can this be, right? You put a deck together, you, you know, go through the slides, and at the end they hand you a check. And <laughs> off you go, right? I mean, how hard can it be? And uh, you, know, you know that scene, what's the movie with, uh, what's his name? Uh, is it Jack Black, where he, he gets told no, like, over and over and over and over again? Uh, that was me. Like, I, it was one scene after another. I was like, and so, and they're like, no. Uh, but it's really cool, no. And it was really hard. Like, I've never heard no that many times in such a short period of time. And we decided to do it anyway. Rick and I decided that it's the right call. We're going to go build this. We took our little development team off of the old product, in stealth mode, built the new product, uh, and we ran out of money. We lived, I, I'll never forget it. I'm, you know, I'm laying in bed one night, I'm staring at the ceiling, my wife says, do you know what you're doing? And I said, no. And uh, I took out a second mortgage on my house to cover payroll. I ended up writing like a quarter million dollars worth of checks to cover payroll. Um, and you know, thank God we built it. We took it to market. It was immediately, you know, very successful, and we got it funded. And you know, uh, the, the rest of the say is history. But uh, I think it's I I often talk about entrepreneurship around town and it's these, these dichotomies and the dichotomies that I talk about is like absolutely believing that you're 100% correct and you ha absolutely have it nailed and at the same time oh, do I really have that? <laughs> you know, is it really the right way to go? You know, and that's that's what I learned from that. Like you, if you don't believe in you, who, who's going to Right? And, and uh, I credit, I will say this, I will credit the guys that wrote, um, if you haven't read me, I'm sure everyone has read to give you those tests of when should you, when should you sort of call it quits. You know, and there's, some, you know, there's great ways to sort of set up measurements as, a, as an entrepreneur as a startup say, this isn't going to happen, and rather than pouring good money after bad, we, we should back off. But it's that funky, you know, dichotomy because at the end of the day, how many times have you heard that story when it's the person who believed and persevered one more iteration, one more funding cycle that ends up being successful? I doubt that was very helpful, but it was entertaining for me. Bob is a startup. Definitely check out our recent book or read anything from Steve Blank. We're interviewing Steve Blank in New York uh, in September, end of this month. We're going to try to bring him to Philadelphia as well. But good starting for if you're, if you're looking out. And we can be agile and develop all this thing. Number two. Who wants to be number three, Doug? <laughs> okay, so my name is Nick of the um, a couple years ago, I bought a domain name called smallbizphilly.com. And I really like it. Um, it sounds generic. I like, I, I, um, my vision for smallbizphilly.com is to be an online resource for people in the Philadelphia region that want to start their business. Now, I don't know anything about web design. And for the past couple years, I've been trying to go to nonprofits such as the SBA, the SBDC, SCORE, etc., asking for some type of partnership. And for some reason, they see me as competition. I don't think they understand, but I actually want to work with them. Like I, I was trying to like share my domain with them from a partnership, and it, nothing really materialized. And um, now it's to a point where I can either um, try to reach capital and pay a web designer five to seven thousand dollars to create my website, or hire a college kid as a senior for seventy-three 
signs of it for free. And I don't know what to do, but I really would like somebody that has the experience and would like to partner with me and share the profits. I'm trying to get, I guess I'm trying to get the best of both worlds because I'm more of a creative type, like I'm a creative journalist. I'm a writer, but I want someone that knows how to write code. And I would write the articles. So, because I don't know anything about writing code, but I can code, right? I need that. But anyhow, um, yeah, I just voice like that. I'm really, really um, a theater guy. But um, anyhow, before I get off subject, um, yeah, can you give me some advice? Because I really, really want Small Biz Philly to be a real nice, static, dream weaver website. Not WordPress, not Joomla. It's a really like, custom design, but I don't have the money. I'm really looking for partnerships. Everyone's looking for a developer. Can you throw yeah. that somewhere? Or how's that work? Yeah, how's that work? Alex, can you help out with that there? Drupal? <laughs> Uh, I feel your pain. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many meetings I take on a monthly basis where it's basically someone's got a great idea and all I need to do is find the right set of developers and we're golden, right? So I guess the, the, the thing I want to challenge you a little bit on, let's just assume it's built for a second. Assume it's built. Like, go to that next step. How are you planning on, what are you going to do with it? What are you, how are you going to monetize it? How are you going to turn it into a business? And I, and I don't mean an answer, but it's more of a rhetorical question. <laughs> uh, could, that's where I would go. Like, I, I, a lot of people would come to me and I say, like, move beyond that. Like, mock it up and take it out and get input, get feedback. If this existed, would you buy it? How much would you pay for it? Who would buy it? What would you do with it? Um, and, and sort of, like, don't get stuck in that. I gotta have it built before anything else can possibly happen. There's a lot of there's a lot of work and exploration you can do before you actually spend the five to seven thousand dollars to build it. Okay. Thank we can you. talk about that. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Number three. Last question. I'm Mike Morsnell with uh, Brand.com. I know very well. Just you don't know, get specific, obviously, but the management styles either you know that you work for people that you really respected, and others that you know you saw a little bit of a different style and didn't really take to that too much. What did you bring with you when you became a leader, and what were you looking for in those different styles? That's an awesome question. Um, I think a lot of what I learned about leadership, I learned in the mailroom. I learned in the mailroom. Uh, I I delivered people's printouts. I delivered people mail, I delivered their lunches, their chairs, their desks, and I responded to the people who treated me with respect. Um, and to this day, that lesson has stayed with me. I, I don't care who you are, what you do, like, I, like we're equals, I treat you with respect. I, you know, you're doing whatever it is you're doing because you're, you know, that's where you're meant to be, and I'm doing what I'm doing because that's where I'm meant to be. Um, to, so to me, the leaders that I really admire are people who uh, is, inspire you to do incredible things and do more than maybe you would have done, you know, otherwise. But they, they, there's that respect, uh, you know, for for the individual. Um, I have a member of my team here tonight, so I mean, you, you, you know, you can ask them. I feel like I uh, I want so much for all of us. It's not me. It's not them. I want I want so much for all of us. And um, and so it's, for me, it's about setting a very clear goal about what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, and infecting people with that uh, excitement about our mission, and, uh, and then basically getting the heck out of their way and letting them do it. Um, I can't do what Mike does. I can't do what Abbott does. Um, God, you know, they're, they're incredible people. They're incredibly talented people. I can't do what Dave for Jerry does. Where's Dave? Um, you know, uh, but what I can do is be very clear about where we're going, why it's important, why I'm excited about it, why they should be excited about it, why they, why we should all work together at Artisan to accomplish it, and that's that's what I was trying to do is just infect people with that with that excitement, and and then manage the exceptions, you know, when, when they have that's what the boss does. <laughs> Great, thanks. Dave, Dave Foster, I'm working on a startup called. Uh, promotes veteran-owned businesses on various uh, social and service sites. I'll say, uh, I, Bob, you and I sat on a panel together about three years ago, I think it was right after you'd been acquired uh, during the Purple the Eye period, and uh, you look much happier. <laughs> uh, just a quick question, very interested to hear what you're reading on a daily basis, lots of information out there, lots of great blogs and websites and so forth. Uh, what are your top four or five in your in terms of source
sorts of information. Yeah, I'll look at the other bases, looking for news updates, blogs, uh, good insights, those kinds of things. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I feel like Sarah Pamela here, for example. <laughs> I mean, all the papers that are available to <laughs> So on a macro level, I read uh, Wall Street Journal every day, I read uh, The Economist weekly, I read uh, Business week, Weekly, uh, so I think that keeps me very much in tune with sort of what's happening. I read uh, Foreign Affairs quarterly, The Economist quarterly, and frankly, I have, I don't know about you guys, I have found Twitter to be like phenomenal in terms of keeping up with what's going on, like you can get the right people that you're following, I am up to the moment on what's going on in any particular uh, area that I want to be, that I want to be you know, uh, informed. Technology, politics, uh, you name it. Uh, and so I check, you know, I've got a great Twitter feed, I feel, and I check that all the time. I read the articles that come up there. And between that and the periodicals that I read, I feel like I'm, I'm very solid. And there are specific Silicon Valley folks, uh, tech folks, specifically, that you want to see for us, uh, you've already made it. I mean, I'll, be, I'll share my Twitter list with you. You know, there's, uh, you know, everybody from, um, uh, what's her name? What's her name? Leaning in? Uh, Charles Schuster. Paul Cheryl. Uh, follow a, a number of the CEOs of the big companies in the Valley. I follow quite a few of the analysts. Uh, I, I actually, I like to follow the guys and gals who are writing the articles for the periodic. So I actually follow a number of the people who write for the uh, Washington Post, who write for the Wall Street Journal, uh, and, and I find that really to be really good as well. There's a guy I'm following right now who's writing a lot about Syria, and I'm, I feel like I'm like up to the second on what's going on in, in Syria. Okay. Take one more question. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Ryan. I work at a place over there called Red Center, but I'm also building something. Um, and uh, something we hear a lot is completing a co-founder to, you know, really keep going, I guess. Um, and it's not that I don't have options, but it's like no one really feels good enough to give half a company to. Um, so what, what are the qualities, I guess, that you look for um, in a co-founder, and um, should you settle or should you hold out? Um, you know, how far along is the department? You know, with the co-founder, um, just put a speed on that. So, um, the first thing I would say is I've never been in your position where I'm going the other way. I'm always trying to be the attractive date to the guy who's, who's already founded the company. Uh, chemistry is incredibly important. I wouldn't sell. Uh, I would never sell. Uh, you put a lot of your life, blood, and energy into whatever this thing is that you're building already. Uh, and so that, that wouldn't feel right to me. Um, what are the reasons to have a co-founder? I mean, I think part of it's sanity for you, right? Like somebody else that you're sharing all the burdens with and, and as you grow this thing. If you went out to, to uh, raise money, they're going to feel better if there are two people at the, you know, uh, at the helm, so to speak. But I wouldn't settle. And, um, uh, you know, I think if you're genuine and clear about what it is you're trying to do, passionate, you can find it. We get Bob around the ball. So Bob, I'm going to have to start with Brian on behalf of the benefits desk, the folks in the audience. Thanks for everything you're doing for Philadelphia. Thanks for being an effective PSL uh, leader. Look forward to, to watching artists and grow. Uh, I always end with a couple call to actions. So one of them is if you're building a native mobile app where you know some of that is, Refer them to Artisan. They're building a game teaching company right here in Philadelphia. We try to use local companies when we can. Um, and then also get involved and join the community. Be a doer here in Philadelphia. We're trying to build uh, a, a rock star network of guys like Bob and Gabe Weinberg and Wayne and other guys that we brought through. We continue to do that. If you haven't found you'd like to see, shoot me an email and I'll try to bring them here. I'll do something my best to do that. And we're also trying to build an awesome community here at Benjamin's Desk. Part of uh, this startup ecosystem is having space, having the infrastructure for these companies to have resources, perhaps find their co-founder. We see that happen every day, with, uh, even with Whitman, who's, who's filmed this today, just joined uh, an interesting company called CrowdGive. So with, without further ado, thank you again, Bob, and uh, one more round of applause.